Yeah, I hope to uh, tell you something about uh, my own work with Wollenhoven, but of course that's not the prime focus to, uh, uh, to be involved with what I'm doing, but uh, to, uh, to, to come to know a little better what, what Wollenhoven is about. And, um, uh, but I must make a couple of remarks to start with. Um, there's nothing on, on that diskette that you've, that you've gotten from the, from the uh, organizing committee. That was because I only learned about a diskette yesterday. So that was a, a bit late to, to do anything about it. So I, I apologize for that, but I guess that was because of the vacation, etc. that the communication just didn't arrive. Um, or at least I didn't uh, get to know. Um, somebody else who spoke this morning um, didn't have it on the diskette either. And um, Bilford said, give it to me. And then I'll include it in the email list. And that will be sent up with the, um, all the addresses of email addresses that, is, yeah. that are going to be sent around. So if yeah. you give whatever you have uh, to him, it will be included in that. The, the problem is, though, that I, I found out about the discussion while, while I was underway coming here. Hmm. So that's, I, I mean, I, I'm, I explain that so that you, you uh, at least uh, understand why there's no, uh, nothing of, of, uh, of this workshop, you know, on the, on the uh, discussion. Uh, my involvement with Hollenhoven, uh, I hope uh, the other people that just came in. Uh, my involvement with uh, Hollenhoven uh, goes back many years. Uh, I was um, one of his many uh, student assistants, so I knew, I knew the man uh, personally, and, uh, and also in connection with that assistantship, I, I, I worked, uh, I, I was able to do some work with him. And I always uh, think back on those years with with pleasure. Now it's it's uh, it's still I mean it's 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 still so real in my mind that I I, I sometimes have to tell myself perhaps not everyone knows who Vollenhoven is or was. Uh, so let me say that uh, Vollenhoven was of course the, the son-in-law of Doi, sorry the brother-in-law of of uh, Doiwerd. <laughs> and uh, they worked uh, together in uh, in building up the uh, at least the basis for uh, what uh, what has come to be called the Reformation of philosophy. And um, Vollenhoven was in fact the, the the first chairman of the Association for uh, Reformation of philosophy, which was then called the Association for Calvinistic philosophy. But it's it's merely a change in name and not change in substance. He uh, he was chairman for something like 28 years. So he, um, he had a firm uh, um, hold and, and, uh, and an important uh, input uh, in, the, in the work of this, of this uh, association. Um, my, associate with my work on Von Hoven now is to, uh, is to uh, uh, try to publish what was his, uh, his lecture notes in a course that, that we would call Introduction to Philosophy. Uh, he called it the Isagoge. In Greek, Isoroge Philosophia. Uh, that's the, supposed to be the Greek for introduction to philosophy. And um, he, uh, he gave that course from 1926, at least until something like 1945 or 48, anyways, in, in, into the late, late 40s. And from 1930, there was a complete uh, 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 mimeographed form of that, of, of, of those lecture notes. And um, when I got to look at those at, at those notes once, then I began to. F I found there was an edition in 1930, and there's a 1931 edition, there's a 1932 edition, there's a 1939 edition. There turned out to be three for 1941, which were uh, which were different. Uh, then there was a 1943 edition, and then the, the 1943 edition was retyped in 1967. Uh, and then I then I discovered in the in the archives when when Vollenhoven's uh, study was. Uh, was transported to the to uh, into a separate archive that there was an edition of uh, of the Isagoge which he used as his own as his own lecture notes and, uh, <coughs> that was with all kinds of corrections in the margins and he changed the date from 1943 to 1945 so that was the that was let's say the most definitive uh, uh, copy eh, of of those lecture notes uh, that uh, that we have. And uh, Von always wanted to, to, to publish uh, the, these, these notes, but his problem was that he kept chain, chain, changing things. He kept changing his mind. There was found he had to correct himself, uh, etc. 
So when he got to, uh, when the idea came to publish, which was in 19, actually in 1967, um, he, he looked at those, uh, at those, uh, at that, uh, those lecture notes, and uh, he wrote a little, a little, a little forward to that, to that edition that, that was made, and he said, well, if this is going to be published, I would actually have to rewrite the whole thing because there were so many other changes that he would want to want to incorporate. So he never got to actually, you know, uh, actually publishing this uh, the, the, this work. So uh, I've uh, taken it upon myself to at least uh, try to get a manuscript uh, together, which uh, which hopefully can be can be published, but at the same time, which will illustrate the uh, the uh, and make accessible these ten different editions that there are of the uh, is uh, uh, so I uh, this introduction. So I've taken the 1945 version as the most definitive, being the, the last that Wollehoven himself actually uh, actually, uh, actually used. And then I indicate with, uh, with, uh, with a critical footnote uh, apparatus uh, whatever, whatever changes <coughs> that there are in the previous uh, editions so that you can, uh, as it were, work, work back. So if you're interested in the 1930 edition, then you just have to look where every time there's a 1930 and there's your, there's your, there's your text. If you're not interested in, 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 in history, forget the footnotes and just simply read, read the text and then you find your 1945 edition. Now that, that's the, I've taken the, I've taken the thing along. This is the, uh, the manuscript uh, which, uh, which is, uh, as far as the text goes, is now, is now complete. There are things like uh, f uh, finishing up forward, and uh, putting it in the index, so there's these, these, these last sorts of things, which probably will, you know, will probably take a lot, a lot of time yet. But anyways, that's it's in a, it's in a final stage of, uh, of, uh, of completion. Are you doing that in English or in Dutch? This is in Dutch, because uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to finalize, you know, Vollehoven's, Vollehoven's work, uh, in through uh, throughout these ten, these ten editions. And if I have to, you know, first, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to get a definitive text uh, uh, made available, which can then perhaps be used as basis for a, a, tra a translation. And in fact, there is one. Uh, uh, John John Cook has, has translated uh, the 1943 version. And uh, but uh, I, I think it's important to, to have some reference point. Uh, which 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 uh, uh, which can be used for for uh, for for the academic work and ac academic studies. So this is in fact a, a Dutch the Dutch text, uh, with no, yeah, made as accurately as I can make it. When will it appear? That I don't know. It's uh, uh, I have to uh, I have to begin uh, no, yeah, talks with whatever publisher you know might might want to take this on. So I I, I just can't say. But I hope it does get to that stage. So um, my uh, my work with with uh, with this text, you know, uh, yeah, uh, made me at least somewhat acquainted, of course, with 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 Volhoven's work. And then at a certain point in the uh, in the um, in the appendix, that is, say, Volhoven himself had, uh, had had an appendix to this work. Uh, and there, I came across a, a sentence. Which I quote here at the beginning of this uh, of the handout here: uh, "He who obeys God's word can certainly still err when it comes to details, but he who does not obey arrives at concepts that are false in their basic structure." And that that struck me because it seems to me that this uh, that this one sentence highlights much of what Volhoven was about. Now you might be inclined to to read it as. Uh, if you're, um, if you want to, if you want to be, uh, you know, you want to be, uh, you want to speak truthfully, you have, you have to, you have to have your Bible open and and make sure that you you have the right the right verse or, or chapter or whatever. That that is not really the meaning that he that he ha has in mind here. And uh, so I want to try to um, highlight what what Volhoven means here. <coughs> I'll read part of the. I'll read. Uh, at least uh, part, part of the paper and part of, part of my uh, p presentation will will be to discuss what further points are, are are indicated on this sheet. So I hope I hope we can keep it then within a uh, manageable time and so that there's uh, sufficient time also for for discussion. Uh, the one sentence uh, which I just just quoted there uh, highlights much of what Holohan was about when he speaks of concepts being false in their basic structure. 
He has in mind an ordering of philosophical concepts in terms of which we give evidence of our understanding of the structure of reality. This understanding of the structure of reality in concepts can, as is the case with any ordering of concepts, concepts with a sort of force at least, eh, they can be true or false. Whether an understanding of reality is true or false depends, as we might be inclined to say, on what reality is. But understanding reality is not that simple. We cannot simply set reality before us, look it up and down, and turn it over, and then draw our conclusions. We, eh, we who view reality, are part of the reality being considered. Hence, any abstract viewing or conceiving that leaves man out of consideration will be incomplete or one-sided. One way to attempt to remedy this situation is by the inclusion of self-reflection, which is, of course, a very classical theme. Vollenhoven, however, does not look favorably on self-reflection in this regard. It, too, may be abstract and one-sided in its own way. He follows a different strategy. He wants to look at reality concretely, and that word is going to be essential here, and that involves the inclusion of man in an all-inclusive sense. Such a concrete consideration of reality takes place for Vollenhoven in what he calls religion. Hence, in his view, the truth or falsity of our conceiving the structure of reality calls for a religious context in order to ascertain its truth value. This somewhat surprising viewpoint, at least I, I think it's probably surprising, is what I hope to discuss in this paper. The conjunction of structure of reality and religion, as we find it in Vollhoven's work, was not formulated by him in a once and for all sort of way. To be truthful in your conceiving of reality is a task. And that means that insight can improve and deepen, and so self-correction can take place. <coughs> in the case of all of formulations, we need to distinguish a basic layout that remained more or less constant and from a number of successive shifts in emphases and wording. I should not follow the focus mainly on this basic layout, but the shifts will nevertheless have to be mentioned, although they can't be explained in full detail. So I shall begin by discussing some basic features of Vollenhoven's notion of reality. Here the basic structure of his conceptualization of reality will come to the fore. Then in the second part, Vollenhoven's view of religion uh, will be brought to bear. And then in the third and final part, the conjunction of the two terms, uh, structure, religion, the structure of reality and religion will be discussed, especially, of course, in the light of the assessment of truth and falsity. The sentence which I quoted occurs in Vollenhoven's epistemological discussion, which discussion formed an appendix to that introduction to philosophy of his. The point at issue here is the ordering of our concepts. The way concepts are ordered is indicative of an understanding of reality that is grasped in these concepts. To take some examples, we form the concepts of mind and of matter. If we now subsume the concept of mind under that of matter, we thereby express an understanding of mind as being, in some sense, dependent on matter. Or, if we form, let's say, a con concepts of body, of soul, and spirit, then their ordering, which we can do in, in, in very various ways, would constitute a basic structure of the view of man. Now, the ordering of concepts is not just a matter of arrangement. It also concerns the determination of their scope. For example, do impulses fall under body, or under soul, or under spirit. We want to know what falls under what when arranging concepts. Now, it's not these examples that Vollenhoven has in mind, though I think these examples are relevant. Vollenhoven's quoted statement occurs in a short discussion of an example of his own choosing, and that was the scope of the notion of the cosmos via via that of divinity. In much of Western philosophy, of course, a distinction is drawn between God and the cosmos. Uh, by the way, the word cosmos is, is Vollenhoven's favorite term, but don't think of that in terms of outer space, or, uh, but it's the, it's the it's, it's, it's a synonym for, for a created reality, so it involves, uh, I mean, of course it involves you know, stars and outer, and outer space, but also the earth and plants and animals, and of course uh, man's body life, etc. So the word cosmos is, an, is another word for, for, for nature. In this connection, it is important to know what falls under what, and more important, what the focal point of the distinction is. 
The notion of God here will presumably include, in this traditional sense then, uh, preeminence, infinitude, power, knowledge, uh, and the like. While the notion of the cosmos will focus on temporality, finitude, change, error, and the like. Now when such notions are used, we must make choices as to what belongs to what. Do the stars partake of divinity, or do they belong to the cosmos? Is there such a thing as divine revelation, or does this merely amount to human assessment of importance? Is the truth of the proposition that 2 plus 2 is 4 a moment of divine thought, or does this truth belong in some sense to the cosmos? Does man have a spark of divinity in him, or is he a creature of the earth? Is he earthy? Such questions, which can be multiplied many times over, have a more than merely academic importance. Human beings respond to the choices that they make in this regard. People who nurture the belief that stars are divine will try to discern in the starry sky some lead for their lives. People who see their own cultures as divinely privileged can all too easily turn around and trod on the differing cultures of others. The notions we have then regarding God and the cosmos come to act as basic for many beliefs and activities. Volohoven too held that something very crucial for our understanding of reality is at stake when speaking of God and the cosmos. Our notions of God and of the cosmos have to be carefully delineated and ascertained. Something of a basic structure, he called it a grondstructuur, or basic pattern, is involved here. And we need to get it right. Uh, we ne always need to get our concepts right. Eh? For say, when we have, when we're dealing with the arith arithmetical notions, and we don't handle them properly, we find out pretty quickly. For example, when failing in our math tests, or when our uh, financial transactions uh, don't show expected results. Getting the basic pattern of the notions of God and cosmos wrong also has its consequences, like in our consideration of values, norms, and social living in our view of nature, in considering human purpose and destiny, in our finding meaning in history. We have a duty to at least search for truth at this level, since it is part and parcel of the task of philosophy to discuss the notion of reality. It belongs to philosophy to deal with this difficulty. So there are two factors that are prominent in discharging eh, of this duty. In the first place, we need to express our understanding of what our notions concerning God and the cosmos involve. Now, these notions are much too rich to be able to express uh, them in any complete way, so we shall limit our expression to what they involve in their core sense. Then secondly, we need to test the truth value of this understanding. Since here, in Volhoven's view, religion comes into the picture, we shall uh, reserve that discussion for the second part of this paper. So I'll now concentrate on that first part about the notions of God and the cosmos. When speaking of God and the cosmos, Volhoven placed himself squarely in the Christian tradition in speaking of God as creator and the cosmos as created reality. This, is in, it, this in itself may, of course, uh, be uh, generally be taken as expressing religious belief, and on that account as lacking sufficient objectivity. Of course, wh whether we can ever be unbiased in speaking at this fundamental level is probably a moot point. Perhaps it's better to speak of a confrontation of biases rather than an attempt to be free of bias. However that may be, we can hardly deny that when speaking of the cosmos, we at least have in mind this reality eh, all, all around us. Even if we discount it as unreal, we are still considering it in the light of the question about reality. In reflecting on reality, we are forced to acknowledge a great diversity of differences, differences between persons, between things, qualities, relations, functions, organizations, and the like. At the same time, these differences display a variety of orderings and of order. Uh, we can discover patterns, uniformities, structures, and the like throughout the differences. This indicates that it is meaningful to speak of a determination of created reality, of cosmic reality. Now, while here an endless discussion begins about the nature of this determination, the difficulty in bringing it to clear expression ought not to cloud our awareness that there is such a determination. Uh, we may be right, and follow certainly assumes that we are right, in maintaining that there is such a determination, while every specific formulation of it may have its problems. We must keep this, this latter distinction in mind when recalling the formula-like expression 
Ben Vollenhoven used throughout his career. He spoke of, in terms of, uh, it was three terms, he spoke of God, law, cosmos. In its bare meaning, this says that the determination of the cos cosmos requires a grounding, which grounding Vollenhoven calls law. And that when speaking of law, we need to include a lawgiver, which is God. We can express this in another way. Since everything of, the, uh, everything of the cosmos seems to be determined in some richly variegated sense, everything displays subjection. This is another crucial term in Vollenhoven. This trait of subjection requires, for our understanding at least, complementation in terms of that to which cosmic things are subject and who or what is sovereign here. So this is another way of speaking of law and of God, respectively. So in the expression God, law, cosmos, God is the sovereign creator and lawgiver, and law is the ground of determination to which the cosmos is subjected. And the cosmos is created reality that stands in subjection uh, to the law. This, in fact, is Wollohoven's preferred summary statement if, however, in this formulation too much specific meaning is already present, then think merely of the cosmos as requiring a principle of determination and an origin, and requiring these because of its status of dependence or that standing in subjection. We then have at least the bare bones of the basic structure or pattern of reality as Wollohoven conceived it. Throughout Vollenhoven's writings, then, this same basic pattern recurs, and Vollenhoven never relinquished it. But he did reconsider his formulation of it when it came to specifying its meaning in a more specific sense. Clearly, one needs to indicate what this basic pattern implies with respect to ontology, epistemology, anthropology, cosmology, and the like. But as insights in these disciplines <coughs> develop and deepen, there can be re re uh, repercussions uh, that will affect, the, let's say, the fine-tuning of, of what you understand of this basic pattern. So that's essentially what, what, uh, what much of uh, Vollenhoven's development comes, uh, comes down to. The basic pattern of god law cosmos is, is maintained, but he gives it a different formulation and a different expression. And those are the three, and I'm going to skip a part of my text now because I'll refer to the, the, to the handout. This is what, what I've summarized here in, uh, under part one. And by those three dashes, the 1930s, the 1940s, eh, up to about 1952, and then what happens in post-1952. Now, some of, some of these, these differences are, of course, incorporated in the addition of the introduction to philosophy I have here, which, uh, which I hope is indicative of, of the fact that it might be an interesting thing to, uh, to use as study material, because you see that uh, Vollenhoven is changing his mind as he, of course, uh, 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 finalizes the text of, uh, of, those, of those lectures. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll simply be brief here because it's, uh, you know, if you really dive, dive into it, you'll never, you'll never, you'll probably ne never end because of all the things you have to say. But uh, you can, you can, I call it at least uh, paradigms. You can see three different paradigms involved in explicating what God, law, cosmos means. And the first one is what uh, Volhoven himself came to call a whole part paradigm. And that is a, yeah, uh, a rather, rather static uh, view of, of God and, and cosmos because Vollenhoven concentrates on the differences between the two. He says, well, God is, an, is, a, is, a, is a sovereign being and the cosmos stands in subjection. Um, God is an infinite being and the cosmos is finite. And uh, those are actually the two chief characteristics that he uses to, to characterize what they then he calls the two basic parts of reality. There's a, there's a sovereign part and there is a part that stands in subjection and, and, and these two parts are, are, the, are the essential makeup of, of reality and then the basic question is where do you draw the dividing line? Eh? So that's, that's where the terminology uh, came up, which, which some of you may know, of talking of the law as boundary. It was the boundary that, that marks eh, the difference between, on the one hand, a, a sovereign infinite being eh, from a, a being, uh, the cosmos, then, uh, that's finite and that stands in subjection. Uh, here, uh, the, uh, the, the view of law as, law as boundary, uh, Volho would then explain in terms of a, a kind of a, a Carperian mindset that he'd say, well, these, uh, see, these, the, 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 this boundary idea is, of course, uh, relevant for, the, for specifying 
what 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 is finite here so the boundary holds eh, the boundary bounds as it were that that which is finite but of course it does not bound 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 god because god is god is infinite so it's a boundary id which works towards uh, specifying finitude and not the other way around in in, in specifying what 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 divinity is here and then he had in mind the uh, the notion of boundary of, of specifying terrains uh, of activity uh, which he would say uh, 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 boundaries which are then uh, specified as, as ordinances. The ordinances of God delineate what should take place in certain terrains of activity uh, and that's how, how he understood the notion the notion of law. Can I ask you, Tony, where does he get his whole part terminology? Where he gets it? Because you don't really explain that here at all. No, I know. Is it simply I, there, there, there's an awful lot of it. Universal uh, it it's, uh, mm, not really, not really, not really. It's more. Universals are part of the moral law. Um, now, that's. <laughs> Very interesting question for me. That's right, okay. Uh, the notion of uh, universals will, will recur in the second and the third paradigm, or at least so in the second paradigm. So, so let me at least, and, and because I, I, I mentioned it here too, let me at least say, say that. Uh, the notion of law traditionally seen is often associated with the notion of universals. And they said Plato, uh, Plato said the determination of reality is uh, it takes it takes place via these forms or, or ideas or whatever, and and they and they are they are entities which the mind is able to to think to cogitate and as I say get a view on, uh, and and they act as the as as, no, yeah, as delimiting notions eh, for 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 organizing our mind and being able to understand things of things of of, of reality. Now, if you if you translate that into into the let's say Volhoven scheme of God, law, cosmos for the, for the 1930s, I have to admit I have to do some more archival research to be to be really sure of, of what of what of what the answer is. But uh, it seems as if the notion of un universals here is part of this boundary idea. So that being 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 part of being part of the law, especially that part of the law. When, when, it, when it concerned the terrain of nature, of, of plants and animals, and, and, and let's say in, in the sense of all, well, in the sense of Plato spoke, spoke of forms. Yeah. I don't that want to take the conversation too far, Gil, no, but I but just want to suggest that in my work on, on uh, Justin Martyr this week and on the Logos, he also used the whole part terminology, and I argue very strongly that the whole there means the sense of perfection. God is perfect. Jesus is the perfect revelation. Well, uh, yeah, and yeah. we have but partial knowledge. Yeah. And that's how that terminology... I'm wondering yeah, if that's how it came into there, the there, there is always, I, I can say that uh, without any qualms, uh, there was always a great love for Plato in, 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 in Vollenhoven, although we always warn against uh, taking Plato too uh, too seriously, T taking Plato too too, too Greek-like, you know, uh, that would that that would be wrong because you, you would place it in a wrong religious context. Yeah. Uh, but 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 there were fundamental uh, insights which 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 Paul Hobbes certainly uh, admired in Plato, or at least the, the, uh, the way he, he would say he's the least objectionable of Greek, of Greek thinkers. I mean, he would put it in that in that negative sense, nice. but within within a negative view, uh, rank as, as as least objectionable. <laughs> Cal, yeah. Quick comment, maybe in his early Reformatsi book, yeah. he uses the part and whole there to distinguish the different kinds of law. Yes. I'm yes. Sure. That might yeah. It. Yeah. Because that that will be that 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 then that then relates to the to to the question of where this boundary has to be has to be placed, and then they say there there are there are all kinds of views in philosophy which place a boundary too high. That is to say, something of what should be reckoned as belonging to to divinity uh, is uh, is seen as being cosmic, or the boundary is put too low in the sense that something which belongs to the cosmos is is made, is made divine. Yeah. Maybe something spiritual, a man, or or whatever you see. Yeah. So, the, so the, his, his chief concern is, there is not so much am I am I being being you know terminologically fortunate in using a whole part uh, term term terminology, but where should we actually uh, you know place this place this boundary as it were? In other words, where how, how should we cogitate? How should we think of the position of the law? And that, that's where. But but there is a there is really? there's a platonic there's a platonic background to to all this. Now then, in the 40s, I think Vollhoven uh, uh, got uh, wet feet with respect to the question of universals here, 
because it's it's uh, he, he he found that at a certain point it's it's very dangerous to speak of of universals in the platonic sense. You know, there are there are forms and there are states of affairs and propositions. There are there are these these abstract structures, uh, and they are in some sense yeah they they somehow transcend uh, the cosmos because uh, they are perhaps part of uh, part of that of that law. He uh, he came to see that that was an that that was not a, a view that he would be able to defend. So in the, in the 40s, you get a reformulation of this God, law, cosmos uh, uh, setup. And what you find here now, uh, that the notion of relations uh, comes in much more centrally. And that's why I call this the relational paradigm. In this relational paradigm, you're not talking, you're no longer talking about, about whole and part, and in fact, in, 19, in the 1941 version of the Isfogi, eh, of, of, of the inlighting, he, he warns against it. Eh? Don't don't talk in terms of whole and part. You're going you're going to get your you're going to get your understanding wrong. You see, so so he's 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 he's, he's taking he's he's in fact correcting in himself. See, in that in that regard, and then he wants to say, and then he wants to say, he says, when you talk about God and God, God and, the, and and the cosmos, of course God is sovereign. And the cosmos stands in subjection, but you've got to see this in an active sense, so that uh, God is related to the world, and that relation that that, that that there is between God and big God in the world, that relation is what we call the law. So that so that's that's a that's an active determining sense of how God relates to the to the to the cosmos, and in that relation you can begin to speak about a, a determining factor, and that determining factor is is the law. But that's but that's that's not uh, that that shouldn't be associated with uh, universals because that has to be seen in connection with the let's say the reverse relation between the cosmos and God. If 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 the whole scheme becomes much more active, you have to ask yourself how does the cosmos now relate relate to God? And then he says that the cosmos uh, uh, relates to God in terms of the activity we call responding. Now to be able to respond. You need to be able to. The cosmos needs to have possibilities, or let's say the, 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 it must be able to 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 do that in a way that is meaningful, so that response cannot simply be um, showing or, or or acting in a way which is preset and pre and, and prefigured, which is pre is pre is predetermined. It must involve an actualization of possibilities, uh, which, of course, as possibilities exist. But there, but not the the response that you and the and the the the, the, uh, the form that you that you give to that uh, response. Now, for the cosmos to be able to respond to God, you need to have you need to have two sides, as it were, to that to the cosmos. You have to have, of course, the things and especially human beings, and to be able to to, to activate that, that that response. But you also need, of course, to be able to refer to possibilities which can be actualized. And that so that so that became for Volhoven now the side of, of universality in the cosmos and the side of individuality in the cosmos, but both in the cosmos, and so that universality within the cosmos that became associated with what Plato was about when he talked when he talked about form and, uh, forms and that. So that uh, this was the the universe. This was part of the the universality of created reality, and that has to be distinguished from the that determining factor. Which comes from the side of God, which determines the cosmos. <coughs> both senses, in both senses, in terms of universality and uh, in individuality. So there, there is a, uh, a clarification, certainly, on on Volhoven's part, what he was, uh, what he was, uh, what he was about. And then in in 1952, or at least uh, after 19, 1952, there is there is another shift. And there is a there is a sense in which it's it's um, yeah, it would take me too far afield to, to to try to to try to explain it, but there is a there is a sense in which he, he thought when I indicate the cosmos also in this active sense I am still being too functional. It's I mean every every activity is seen as, as kind of a as kind of an, an expression of functionality. And if you know something about the, the setup of the of the of the philosophy of the law idea, uh, that uh, that is associated with these modal uh, these, these modal functions, uh, the modalities in that. So that the the whole, let's say that the, the cosmos itself was kind of was kind of set in a context of modalities. That was the modalities which which predominated. And he said, mm, yeah, the, he, uh, he could he, at a certain point he could no longer 
defend that uh, that view. Of course, there are modalities in the way in the way in the way they spoke of it, but Vollenhoven found more, yeah, uh, let's see, more, more important to the cosmos itself is actually what 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 occurs in the cosmos as it progresses, as the cosmos un unfolds, and so he came to view the notion of genesis as being more, yeah, more 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 penetrating. Uh, in an indicate, in indicating what the what the, what the cosmos is about, then having this this this, this let's say this model, uh, the the modality scheme act as a framework. So it's not as if he no longer held to held held to the uh, the modality uh, etc. Of course he, he held to that, but no longer as being let's say the, the defining scheme in terms of which the the, the cosmos is, uh, is, uh, is is approached. So there's there is, there is that sort of a shift. Right. Right. I guess I'm having a hard time seeing how can you how could he deal with Genesis apart from the moral structure? It's a it's a it's a distinct determination as he called it. So Dorit Dorit has Dorit has development within 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 the biotic modality. Well, actually, Volo always one of the many disagreements that Volo and Dorit and Dorit and Dorit had, and he says uh, uh, the biological modality, uh, the, the organic organic functioning, he said, is is it has its own kind of regularity in terms of uh, metabolism, growth, and and and, <coughs> and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Said, but 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 genesis, he said, is how an individual uh, pr uh, comes to be from out from out of other individuals, and 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 uh, and an individual is always something which has the which represents the full modal. Uh, the full modal uh, diversity, the full modal scope, you see, so that you can't you can't explain that in terms of in terms of a reference point to just to just to just one of those functions. That was that was his that was at least the basic idea there. Now he uh, he came he, he did this partially too to try to uh, uh, bridge a difference which which he and Doyle had on, uh, on this on this point because <coughs> Doyle too spoke spoke of the cosmos and spoke of law. But when Dorian speaks and speaks of law, he always speaks of the law as the side of the cosmos. And in fact, this, the law as side of the cosmos is what Volhoven meant when he also spoke of the, the universal side. But he distinguished the law from that. So then at a certain point in, 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 in his, early, his early 50s, uh, the, the text is, uh, is, is, is uh, published in this, uh, in this volume that uh, Corbril and I have, have put out, that Volhoven said, okay, okay, I'm willing to call this universal side of the cosmos law, and then I'll call it law in the cosmos. Now, Volhoven had always said law holds for the cosmos, not in the head, so, so there was a terminological shift here. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to say that regularity, uh, this universality that you see, the cosmos, I'm willing to call that and to call that law. So, so then you say, okay, that's, he's willing to call it that, that's a verbal shift. But then it turned out that there's another verbal uh, verbal shift in what he in what Volokhov himself had always considered to be the law that holds for the cosmos, and he began to call that then the creation command. So that, in fact, Volokhov was able to maintain his own his own position, where, where, whereas uh, yeah he made kind of a he seemed to make uh, make a, a something of, of a shift uh, towards towards uh, towards the door, at least in question of uh, terminology, but. Um, uh, the, the the shift that that really takes takes place here is really the shift in what is now involved in this in this creation command and in the creation command is the calling forth of reality so that this whole genetic moment is actually is actually the of, of, of central of central importance here and then of course in in what comes forth of course you then deal with things that have motor functions and 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 they can act in different in different in different ways and has and has a, a universal side in which uh, Possibilities are able to be uh, act actualized, and this sort of thing. So there, there is the the actual the actual shift. Now, these are three different paradigms, three different paradigms as to well, an understanding of the structure of reality. That is to say, if you take the structure of reality to be uh, uh, as as indicated by by the, the notion of God, law, and and cosmos, then of course you have to ask. Not, o I mean, not only connection with these, with these three uh, param paradigms, but any, let's say, any philosophical conception as to what reality uh, uh, looks like or the way to conceive it. Can we speak of truth here? Which one, which one of these paradigms is true? Yeah. Now, often, of course, people will say, it's, you, you can't speak of truth at, that, at, at, at this level. It's, it's a view that you have. It's an hypothesis that you have. 
and uh, you may like it or you may not like it, eh? and, and that may be the reason for your preferring one or, or, against, or against the other. But uh, von der Hoeven said, no, sorry, it's a conceptual, uh, it's, it's a conceptual construct, as it were. I mean, your understanding involves certain basic, certain basic concepts, and and they are basic concepts which have, which which are going to work for you in a certain way. So there's going to be a certain force, you know, associated with this uh, uh, understanding. So if for other concepts you will, you have no qualms. In fact, you would demand it eh, that the that the that the that the truth criteria be spe specified. Why is it that we can't eh, specify truth? Criteria for such a uh, such a broad notion as what as, as what reality is. So Volham wants to maintain that here is a there that, that there's good reason at least uh, that there's a task here to ask about the about the truth of a uh, of these basic patterns concerning concerning reality. And here now is then where Volham's view of religion uh, com comes in. And then I will return to my text. Well, was your religion? That's yeah, then. The time. Are we supposed to leave it five? Or do we have some more well, we started five? late, so I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. So we did. Okay. I just want to find yeah, out. No, okay, yeah, no, okay, yeah, I'm okay. I, ha I have to act as chairman now. Yeah, then. <laughs> I just want to ask it whether if you plan to talk the whole session out, then we can talk, discuss something afterwards, then it doesn't matter. Then we just listen to you all the time. Okay. But if we decide as a group to go until 20 past five or till half past five, then. You can decide uh, what, when you want. When no, you start I, I think I think we have to. I think we should stick to a to a reasonable time time scheme. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, no, an hour eh, has been reserved. Uh, we started ten after four. Yeah, I think normally you were supposed to have half an hour for the speaker, or you'd be going for the important minutes. I've already. I know we started late, but yeah. so uh, it's fifty minutes now. Um, uh, would uh, acting again as chairman? Uh, would, you, <laughs> would you be willing if I if I just try to summarize without without reading? Hey, but simply summarize what I'm what what, what, I, what I'm about with this view of religion, what Volum is about in terms of religion, and how that relates to truth truth value. And then I'll, I'll I hope I can keep that within within reasonable bounds. At least it should be shorter than if I read the part of the text that I that I intended to read. And is it possible for us to get a copy of your manuscript later on somehow? Um, uh, what does whole office view of religion amount to? And uh, this was actually one of the surprising things when I, when I was working on that uh, on the text of the of the uh, in, in introduction to philosophy. Because it's 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 yeah almost tucked away. It's an important part, but it seems to be uh, tucked away uh, in in a place uh, that no one seems to have come to. You know, you you read the first 15, 20, 30, 30 pages, and then and then you, you seem to stop. And um, Mavolovan has has a very explicit view a view of religion, and he says, yeah, religion is usually seen you know as uh, as referring to things transcendent, of course. Yeah, it involves God, uh, 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 heaven, and whatever. Uh, but the real focus of religion is not merely transcendence. In fact, Paul was always, always rather, was, was rather against that. Uh, the focus of, tra of of religion, he says, is on concreteness. Uh, concreteness in the sense that, that that what life in the very in the very concrete in the day-to-day -day sense uh, means is something that has to have meaning in terms of. Yeah, you being a creature and standing in relationship to God, and so that so that your relation to God is not merely a matter of having certain beliefs. I mean, it is that, but it's it's a lot more than that. It must also involve all kinds of uh, assessment of values, assessment of strategy. What am I to do? What should I do? What should I not do? Eh? How am I going to implement that? So that ultimately, what you concretely do in terms of what how you live eh, and, and 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 what you what you understand your life to be is something that cannot be divorced from yeah from the from a religious uh, meaning a religious insight into life because it will itself involve the, the the god the god creature the god creature relationship so that's how that's how he focuses on 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 the word concrete he wants also to be able to include then the notion of man in an all inclusive sense if we're going to speak about reality we have to include the reality of man, but if we include the reality of man, surely we're not just going to say, well, man, you know, man's mind, or man's will, or man's feeling, or, or, or man's activities on Sunday, and, 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 you know, I mean, I mean it, it's got to be itself in an all-inclusive sense. So that's why if you take religion to be, uh, to be focused, 
And if concreteness means in, in, in itself already something which, which, which involves your, your uh, relationship to God, then you, you are including man in an all-inclusive sense uh, in, this, in, this, in, this, um, in this discussion of, uh, of, 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 what, uh, of, of what a view of reality uh, can, can mean. So how does he do that now? He, he says, well, when you talk about, uh, when you, of course, when you, when you talk about religion, you're going to also, no, let me say it differently. When you, when, you, when, you, when you have your philosophical conception of reality, you're also going to ask what it means. That's very, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a modernist thinker, you're going to say, well, my conception of reality has to have meaning because this is going to be the basis for my scientific thought. Uh, the basis for my scientific thought is important because then we're going to have uh, uh, a sort of a, a scheme uh, for technological implication, uh, uh, imp implementation. And if we have, ha have that, we can, we can control nature better, we can control ourselves better. And so, so, so there, is a, there is a pattern of concretization that takes, that takes place here. A certain understanding of, of reality uh, gets to be implemented in a way that it affects uh, concrete living in a certain way which, 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 which demonstrates a certain understanding of that reality. Now you can say, but surely understanding reality is not ultimately a matter of control of nature, etc. You know, perhaps, you're an, uh, perhaps you're an artist and perhaps you say, no, 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 reality is for me. Is, a, is, is kind of an, an aesthetic sort of, a sort of uh, 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 feeling, uh, feeling contact with, with, uh, with reality. So my view of reality has to be such that it's going to sensitize me right, to, 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 to all kinds of uh, facets and feelings in connection with, 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 uh, with reality because I want to be able to enjoy it. Now, that will be another sort of implementation. And so, and so you can have all kinds of implementation of your view the philosophical view of, of, of reality, which, yeah, which, which comes to expression when you look at the actual concreteness, concreteness of life. Now, Wollhoven then will say, okay, now if we're going to implement real, uh, our view of, of reality, we, we're, gonna, we, we, we're going to do it now in terms of, in terms of religion, because that's the most all-inclusive context that we have. But now, of course, we can ask everybody, fill it in according to your religion. I mean, you, you, you are now, uh, as a transcending philosophy in the, strict sense, in the strict sense of the word, because now you have to give a meaning to steps which you use when you are philosophizing. Now, what are the basic concepts that Bolo when is used? Well, the notion of, of God, eh, or at least origin uh, as creator, law as a uh, determining factor, and of course, the cosmic, the cosmic reality. But if you view this now from out of, from out of, from out of a religious perspective, and then Fallahov will say, and of course the Calvinistic tradition, because that, hey, that's the tradition for which he speaks. So we're not just going to talk about God's sovereignty and, and, and in terms of hey, God, God being the creator. He's also God the revealer. He's also God the spirit guide. And the, the, there's a notion of, of divine sovereignty, which is, which is triune. It's the triune God which is, which, which is, which is sovereign. So from out of our religious, religious perspective, that's how we're going to yeah, not a thing, but that's how we're going to react to, or that's how how we are going to uh, understand sovereignty. Sovereignty is is has, is a triune sort of thing, so it, it's more than simply ha having meaning for the for the cosmos in in strict sense as as result of creative work. There's also the the, um, the let's say the two other persons of the, of the Trinity, which has an, which has an effect. Here. And the same thing holds in terms in terms of law. You're going to say, yeah, with 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 respect to the cosmos. You want to be able to speak of law because structure has to be grounded somehow. But when it comes to implementation of that understanding of reality, when you when you when you try to uh, make something uh, concrete of it, you're going to have to have some interpretive scheme. You have to be able to you have to have an an orienting scheme, an orientation in order to take what that those abstract concepts and put them to work in a in a in a in a. In a